coming to you from Los Angeles once again today. Today our adventures bring us to Wilshire and Fairfax, to the Academy of Motion Pictures Museum. Days with Jordan the Lion begins right now. Now the Academy Museum was a long, long time coming. For those of you that watch my channel, you know all about Debbie Reynolds trying to create an ultimate Hollywood museum. And for a long time, the Academy just really had no interest in being a part of it. And then once she sold her collection, years later they came around, they started putting this together. So I'm excited to see what, they, what the collection is they have here. All right, we are in $25 entrance and FYI, if you're in LA, mid-July, mandatory mask and mandatory vaccination proof. They're showing Master Bruce and Enter the Dragon. I know they have one of those costumes. That's one of the things I'm most excited to see. So here's the room of Oscar awards. You're not allowed to sell an Oscar, but I know that uh, Clark Gable gave away one of his to a kid and Steven Spielberg acquired it back. So I want to see that. Now this one's really interesting. This is Sidney Poitier's for Lilies of the Field. Here we have the Academy Award for Best Story and Screenplay for Sunset Boulevard. Wow. That's very cool. Looks like normally they have Hattie McDaniel's Oscar from Gone with the Wind, but it's gone right now. So here it is. I saw this a long time ago when I was in the Academy offices. They used to display it in there. This is the Clark Gable Award that he gave away to one of his friend's sons because he liked it. Um, Clark, this, he won this for It Happened One Night, but that was a total fluke because when the movie, when they first were like casting it, it was a horrible screenplay that Francis or that uh, Frank Capra was working on, and Louis B. Mayer ended up loaning Clark Gable out for this as a punishment. And then they reworked the script and made it funny. And then Clark Gable inadvertently was nominated and won the award. So it's kind of a really groundbreaking thing. And it's the old style award too. You can tell by the base. It doesn't match the the thick base that they have now. But this was for it happened one night just flat out gave it away. And then this is Mary Pickford's Oscar from 1929. Now in this room they have a couple of dresses, but they could have done a really good job of identifying them. I can't tell what they're from or what they are. So I finally, I walked all the way around. I could not find a description for any of these. So I had to ask somebody that worked here and they told me this was Laura Dern's dress from when she won an award recently. Then the one over here was Rita Moreno's dress that she accepted West Side Story in and then she refashioned it to present an award in 2008. And then this is something that Cher wore to present an award. Pretty out there outfit. If you're a watch guy, you know this one. This is a really famous Paul Newman Rolex. Daytona 6239, so his personal watch, highly, highly collected, highly, I mean, we're talking super expensive, and it was a gift from his wife, there he is wearing it. Wow, there it is, Bruce Lee's costume from Enter the Dragon, that is absolutely amazing, look at that, such a good movie, he really like redefined that genre, he made it just like acceptable and liked by everyone. They also have one of his main props here too. Oh, that's cool. There's their proof saying that he liked the fusion of Western and Eastern traditions. Yes, these are Bruce Lee's nunchucks. First got the nunchucks training from Dan Anasanto in the mid-1960s. He's still around. It's still teaching actually. Dan is. He mastered the weapon using it in many films leading to its broad popularization. Here's Bruce's script for Enter the Dragon that he did some doodling and drawing on. That's great. Then here he's choreographed one of his fight sequences. Over here you can see Orson Welles, Citizen Kane, and Rosebud. The sled at the end of the movie. Of course they would have had a couple of them so they could burn one, but they did three prop sleds because, you know, it's thrown into the furnace at the end. But he didn't like the first take and he loved the second, so this was the third sled they were gonna burn. Now 
now we just made a whole series of videos with Todd Fisher and Todd was showing us all of his lens collection and everything and here again he has loaned his lenses out that he owns for Citizen Kane that were used by Greg Toland and those are the actual lenses that shot Citizen Kane along with a real script an actual shooting script there you can see Orson filming Citizen Kane where he dug up the floor to put the camera down to get a better effect and then one of the original posters and of course we know that's one of Prince's guitars one of the famous guitars and here's more of the stuff from Do The Right Thing Robin Harris is really good in Do The Right Thing I think I like him Danny Aiello also really good just a good movie. This is kind of nice. These are the storyboards from the Treasure of the Sierra Madre that would have uh, been starring Humphrey Bogart. This is what they would do before they shot the movie to kind of give an idea of what they want to each scene to look like so they would draw it out. These films revolutionized the native image of the world. This is pretty cool. This is the typewriter that wrote Psycho. How about that? Wow. <laughs> Olympia typewriter used by Joseph Stefano. Now we are entering the Wizard of Oz section. As you can tell, the ruby slippers are right in front of us. I wish they would rotate on that little plate. But very beautiful. The pair that Debbie has, Debbie originally had the, uh, Debbie Reynolds, she had the Arabian ones is what they were called. But um, MGM ended up gifting her another pair that was made out of the same exact materials from the original batches. So hers were made specifically for her with the same exact everything that were made in these from the same box of materials and that's not all look what else they have of the Wizard of Oz here we have a couple of Dorothy's dresses Let's see this one was worn by Judy Garland as Dorothy and then the one next to it this I believe was her stand-in yeah not her photo double this would have been her stand-in stand-ins are used to uh, they need someone that's the same height, same proportion, everything to set up the lighting and everything, set up the shots before the actor comes in. So that would have been on the set, definitely, but not seen in the movie. Only this one. It's a beauty, isn't it? And then right next to here, the uniform worn by the Munchkin soldier. That's very cool also. Look at that. So inventive. makeup and costuming for the movie so they did character sketches concept art and this is the wicked witch the cowardly lion scarecrow of course the tin man and then you can see some of their early test photos to see what the actors would look like before they cast them and right over here, look at this. This is amazing. I'm pretty sure I've seen this before. It was at the Museum of Pop Art in Seattle. That is Burt Lars, Cowardly Lion costume. Well, at least the, the uh, mane of it anyway. And the Wicked Witch's hat. Her actual hat. <laughs> she used to terrify the bejesus out of me when I was a kid just like she was supposed to. It's pretty cool to see. Said it was all black, so they had to use extra lights to make it register properly on film. Here we have different photo tests for other actresses that were tested as the Wicked Witch. Gail Sondergrass. And look at that, those are handwritten 
early draftings of the script. Huh, from Noel Langley. You can see dated 1938 at the top. Look at this amazing overhead crane production photo. You can see Dorothy right in here with Glenda Goodwitch. There's the camera arm. And take a look at that. How about that? The Technicolor three strip camera that they filmed Wizard of Oz with. That is so cool. Look at that. They even put some film in the camera so you can kind of see how it would have looped through and everything as if it were ready to shoot. Very cool. So as we come in this room full of costumes, this is actually from Midsummer, which is a pretty good movie. I saw it. That's the May Queen's dress, made out of like all flowers. The costume on the left is from Crazy Rich Asians, which I did not see. So I got nothing really to say about that because I don't know anything about that. But this is from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. That's Brad Pitt's. I love that movie. I thought that was awesome. And he's awesome in it. Look at the belt buckle, since he plays like a stuntman. They have like a cameraman belt buckle, like a union belt buckle, pretty cool. And then he was wearing moccasins. 1969 era moccasin type look. Very cool. So this was Matthew McConaughey's outfit in Interstellar. That was a great movie. I really dug that one. And here we have Jeff Bridges' Rooster Cogburn outfit from the True Grit remake, which was good. I actually like that one too. I like Jeff Bridges. Oh look, they even have like a fake beard on the mannequin up there. I'm a huge Big Lebowski fan. Huge Big Lebowski fan, so to see this is really cool. It's the dude's bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> he's always in that thing, but especially when he's going to Ralph's to get his creamer for his coffee. And that's the photo they're matching it up down there. Dude sandals. <laughs> Love it when he goes to meet the other Jeffrey Lebowski and he's like, is this the way you go out looking for a job on a weekday? He goes, weekday? What day is this? <laughs> then this dress is from Hail Caesar. And then I also like this movie, La La Land. That was Emma Stone's outfit from La La Land. Now that's actually really cool because that's from The Wiz. It's really neat to see. It's a very inventive movie. Michael Jackson is the Scarecrow, Diana Ross is Dorothy. And then this one is Diana Ross's outfit, playing Billie Holiday. And you can see that she's got the B monogrammed on the chest. And then this one was, of course, one of Elton John's costumes from the Elton John movie. I mean, you could say that is one spectacular job on a costuming department for a movie. They really outdid themselves here. Now here we have one of Russell Crowe's outfits from Gladiator. It's pretty cool. That was like a breakout movie for him. And a real classic. And then this one is from Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And then we can see the back of the whiz dress right here. The back of that crown.
Then this one was one of Salma Hayek's costumes from Frida. She played Frida Kahlo. Now this very colorful costume is from Weekend in Havana, worn by Carmen Miranda. That's actually what made me, a, uh, that's what turned me on to the Marx Brothers was seeing her and Groucho in Copacabana. <coughs> she always had those Cuban costumes and the big headdresses, known for that. And then this costume was Philip Marlowe's costume in The Big Sleep, played by Humphrey Bogart. Very popular detective series, Philip Marlowe. Several people played Philip Marlowe in movies. Humphrey was The Big Sleep. Here's one of Joan Crawford's costumes from Mildred Pierce, which is also another great movie. Mildred is left by her husband and basically left to fend for herself and opens up her own restaurant and becomes a success on her own. Very amazing movie and I think Joan Crawford was nominated, maybe even won an Oscar for that, forget. But very cool. She was a great actress. Very cool to see her costume from that iconic movie. Now that's also pretty cool. That's Marlon Brando's Fletcher Christian outfit from Mutiny on the Bounty, which was a remake from the Clark Gable Charles Lawton version. It's very cool that they have Marlon's costume in here. Marlon was very anti the business in many ways, so kind of interesting to see him represented here. They had to make multiple costumes for each character because of all the scenes and how the costumes would be destroyed. Here we have a life mask of Grace Kelly. None of the clothes really say anyone one or the other. It also was kind of groundbreaking because we didn't have a lot of films that told the Black American story. It was Don Cheadle. Really fun to see it in a black context. And then here's some of Eddie Murphy's masks. Really important that he wore to playing Rudy Ray Moore in Dolomite. You are exhibiting a costume because it Dolomite is my name. Most people marvel when they look at the costume. And here's a it's skin test so for the King Kong computer-generated mask that they used, the made by Rick Baker. And then here they're showing it was straight um, costume design. One of the prosthetics that Leonardo DiCaprio wore in his chest for The Revenant to show all of his scarring and damage. And there you can see the makeup department actually putting it on. Leonardo there. And what it would look like on him. Now we've entered the backdrops area. And I just went and saw the backdrops exhibit and Boca Raton, and they had a different, a close-up of this from North by Northwest, Hitchcock, but down here you can actually walk in the room down there and pose with it, but I thought it was kind of cooler to show it from up here. They had several backdrops for this because Hitchcock wasn't allowed to film anywhere near the original Mount Rushmore because they thought that he was Kind of going to make fun of it. That's really cool to see. That's all a canvas painting. Brush more, climbed up the back and found that on the top of each one of the heads was a huge iron ring with a cable and a bolson's chair. <laughs> so I, uh, I volunteered to to work with this rusty cable. Yeah, that guy scaled down so and took photos from every angle. angle so that he could recreate this for Hitchcock. This is actually pretty cool. This is a Louis Lemire camera from about 1896, serial number 407. Look at that, um, original Lemire movie camera. And they even have some of the film strip that would have went with it to film. That's amazing. 
There they are advertising their movies. This is what that camera would have filmed. So as I came up the escalators, I'm seeing Bruce hanging from the ceiling. That is Bruce from Jaws, one of the Jaws props. Okay, my friends, so that was it. What did you think? I'll tell you this, like my, my personal honest opinion. Um, it's five floors and they only have memorabilia and costumes on the second floor. Third floor they had the Mount Rushmore backdrop. I just felt like there was so much dead space for as big as the museum is and as much stuff as they could have had. I just, I think they really missed a lot of opportunity and a lot of story holes in the history of cinema. I just, I know, well, I'll put it this way. I think Todd Fisher's museum at his house is better than what I saw here. I think he had more interesting memorabilia and I just, I feel like the way that they're displaying it, they show like one item and they have all kinds of pictures and all this stuff, but I don't think people come for a, a giant story about it. I think a lot of people want to see stuff and I just didn't think there was enough stuff to see for five floors for $25. That's just my personal opinion, but I hope you guys enjoyed seeing it. If you have never gotten here, I mean, it's only been here for a year, but if you don't think you'll ever get here, may never get out of wherever you live. <laughs> I hope this gave you a little idea of what it was. Thank you all for watching. If you're new here, please hit the like button, please subscribe, and please ring the bell for notifications. We will see you all next time from the Academy Museum. Have a great night in Los Angeles. Goodbye. Goodbye.